Good evening, everybody. Welcome, welcome, welcome to Seeds of Victory Global Bible Study. We were having a little bit of problem connecting, but we're good to go, and we want to thank you for being here. I'm Dr. Kenneth Hyatt, and this is Pastor Cynthia Hyatt, and we want to thank you for joining us. We're going to have a good time around the Word, so I want you to get your Bible, get your notebook, and get ready, because I think you're going to learn some very interesting things tonight as we delve into the Word of God. And uh, let us know uh, how the webcast is looking. Are you getting anything online? Not yet. It takes about 10 seconds. Okay. And so we, like I said, we had a little bit of problem. There we are. Um, so, good. We're online. Yay! We're, online. we're good. We're good. We're good. And I suppose y'all can hear us. I hope you can. Yeah. I believe you can. Well, according to the software, you can. So hopefully, <laughs> hopefully you're good to go. So, yeah. But we, who all have we got here? We Someone. have Monty and Beryl Yay! in the house and we Yoda. Yes, we can't we forget do. Yoda. Yes. In the back, we have our grandson, yes. Zane, Zane, is with us. Yay. He's Yay. hanging out. And we have Burl. Hey, man. And Robert Davis and man. Francis. Yay. Hey, and Francis. Tony and Sandra. Good. We're glad y'all are here. Man, Thanks that's a for good being start. Here. Yeah. We're giving everybody a chance to come through the yeah. door, and you're getting stuff on chat already. Okay, Burl says, I see Kenneth and Cynthia, and you guys look and sound great. Yay. Yay. <laughs> good, 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 good. Good. All right. Good. And there's Miss Lucille. Good. Hey, Good evening, Lucille, everyone. I'm glad you're Coming here. in loud and clear. And, Good. And um, we do need to pray for Dan and Shasta. She's had some health mm -hmm. issues. And, yeah. And so. Yeah. Need to pray for her. But she gave us testimony several yeah, days ago. That's right. Last week when we were praying. For healing. For healing. Uh, she was really, really sick at her stomach. And thought she was going to be very sick. Well, she had already been very sick uh -huh. for a while. Yeah. And when we prayed, she was instantly healed. That's awesome. Was relieved instantly. Yes. yes. But do continue. She ended up with some issues on Friday, I believe it was, mm -hmm. that um, she needs a lot of prayer. Mm -hmm. She and Dan both need prayer. Yes, they do. So... Anyway, hold them up before the and don't forget to keep praying for Tina and Jake. Yes, amen. So. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, amen. Yeah, I had forgotten that, but that's that was a good report because mm -hmm. they called us after the webcast mm -hmm. and said this is what happened. So I mm -hmm. thought that was really cool. Very good. So the Lord is good. There is no time or distance in the realm of the spirit, and uh, mm -hmm. that that's just awesome. Praise God. Well, and speaking of distance, it's six weeks till we go to Romania. To Romania. This time, six weeks from now, we will be there doing ministry. Yes. We'll be there doing something. We'll be there <laughs> with Merle. <laughs> Merle is our guide. Yeah, I know. <laughs> I, I'm in much prayer. <laughs> and well, we're so, looking forward to it. Yes, it's going to be a lot are. of fun. Uh, six weeks from today, yeah. actually tomorrow uh, yesterday that would yeah. be yesterday yeah. um mm -hmm. we'll be there yeah and it, the time is going to go by pretty it's fast it's going to go very quickly mm -hmm. yes it is yeah amen amen all right you guys ready let's do it let's pray and get started father we just come before you we thank you for this time around the word of god mm -hmm. i thank you for the spirit of wisdom and revelation being made manifest to your people we just thank you for it in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. I want you to go with me, please, to 1 Peter chapter 4 and verse 17, and also go to Matthew 18. 1 Peter chapter 4, Matthew chapter 18. And uh, we're still talking about taking our place as kings. We are talking about... Um, the church's position as an avenue or a vehicle of judgment in the earth and certainly the, even the judgment of God among God's people. And so we've been looking at that. It's something that a lot of people are um, pretty ignorant of for the most part. There's been very little teaching on the subject of judgment. And um, 
a lot of people, a lot of Christians are afraid of judgment. They've been told never to judge anything, so on. But that is, that is not in line with the Word of God. So we've been looking at that and studying it. And I've been learning some things myself out of this because I never know uh, from week to week where we're going to go, how we're going to go, where the Lord's going to take it. And so this is very interesting for me as well. So mm -hmm. anyway, I hope you're receiving some things from it. Amen. So well, quickly, Burl says six weeks from right now, it will be two o'clock in the morning on Wednesday. <laughs> <laughs> And Dan and Shasta are here. Oh, good. Yay. <coughs> good, guys. I'm good. glad you're here. Yes. Hey, Verl, what is the what is the time difference? I know it's... Well, if it's, it's 7 o'clock here and it's 2 o'clock there, right that's now. 7 hours. Oh, 7 hours. Then that's less than I thought it'd be because it's 6 hours to in Ireland. I thought it'd be like a couple more hours difference. So, so 7 hours difference here. Yeah, okay. Yeah. All right. All right. First Peter chapter 4. We're going to look at the 17th verse. 1 Peter chapter 4 and verse 17 in the King James says, For the time has come that judgment must begin at the house of God. And if it first begin at us, what shall, be, what shall the end be of them that obey not the gospel of God? Now one of the scriptures that we've looked at in this study, and I'll just shoot it to you on screen, 1 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 15 says, Paul is speaking, he said, But if I tarry long, that thou mayest know how you ought to behave yourself in the house of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and ground of the truth. And so we have scriptural basis here for substituting the phrase house of God with church. So let's read it that way says, For the time has come that judgment must begin at the church of God, and if it first begin at us, what shall the end be of them that obey not the gospel of God? Now, one of the things that I've shared with you in breaking this down, looking at it in the Greek text, the word time there would be better translated as the word season says, for the season has come that judgment must begin. The King James says, at the house of God. But the literal Greek text says, from the church of God. So let's read it that way. For the season has come that judgment must begin from the house of God. And if it first begin at us, what shall the end be of them that obey not the gospel of God? Prepositions are very, very important. There's a lot of difference between at and from. And uh, I'm no Greek scholar by any stretch of the imagination, but I want to suggest to you that if you're interested in, in breaking down um, Scripture and looking at Greek, and particularly the Greek prepositions, uh, there is a Bible called the Companion Bible by E.W. Bullinger. And uh, I don't agree with everything in his Bible. I don't agree with all his notes. But by the same token, I don't own a study Bible that I agree 100% with anyway. And so there's a lot of things in there that I don't agree with. However, there's a lot of things in there, particularly in the breakdown, of, especially of the New Testament, that is very, very good. And uh, looking at his... Um, notes and looking at other notes involved in this verse of scripture it would have been it would have been better translated to say judgment must begin from the house of god and that changes the whole perspective mm -hmm. because every time i've read that it's like okay god's going to tear everybody up in the church first <laughs> then he'll go to the world he's going to get us first we're first in line mm -hmm. and that's not what it says at all <clears throat> what it's saying is judgment must begin from the house of God we are the vehicle of judgment in the earth we're the vehicle of the judgment of God first of all in our midst and secondly out to the world so again it is the time or the season or the season has come that judgment must begin from the house of God. Now, I've had you take note of the word judgment. It is the Greek word krima, K-R-I-M-A, krima. 
we get our word crime from it. So this could be translated as a sentence or a judgment against a crime. Now, I've given you the, the, the dictionary of a definition of a crime. Let me do it one more time. <clears throat> a crime, you don't need to write this down. I'm just doing this for clarification. A crime is an action or omission that constitutes an offense that may be prosecuted by the state and is punishable by law. A crime is also an illegal activity. A crime is an action or activity that, although not illegal, is considered to be evil, shameful, or wrong. And this word crema refers not only to the act of a crime, but to the judgment against a crime. So let me read to you again my translation uh, as I put the Greek together. Let me just read to you my translation. I, again, I don't know that this will hold up in court, but at the same time, it kind of conveys, I think, what the writer was wanting to say. Uh, it, is the, it is the season of judgment and sentencing against that which is immoral, illegal, and criminal. And this judgment comes from the house of God, which is the church. So again, we are to be the vehicle, we are to be the avenue of God's judgment in the earth. And as you go through, particularly the New Testament, you find out that there are numerous instances, there are places where the New Testament church exercised judgment. We're going to look at a couple of those before we get through one of them in just a moment. But the Apostle Paul actually um, talked about the church being a place uh, where disputes were settled, where the church actually uh, took the place of the secular court system. In 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 1 through 3, the Apostle Paul said, Dare any of you, having a matter against another or another brother, go to law before the unjust or the unrighteous, and not before the saints? Do you not know that the saints shall judge the world? And if the world shall be judged by you, are you unworthy to judge the smallest matters? Know you not that we shall judge angels? How much more things that pertain to this life? Now, as I shared with you, in the first century uh, church, many of the believers preferred, if they, if they had an issue against a brother or a sister, uh, they preferred to take it before the church rather than the secular courts, Roman or Jewish either one, because both of these court systems were prejudiced against Christians. And so they preferred to take it before the saints. Another reason that... that believers preferred to uh, settle issues in the church rather than the courts was because m many of them wanted their cases decided uh, by the Word of God rather than uh, natural secular laws. I hope to get into that in more detail later. And so many of them preferred, if there was an issue, if there was a problem, uh, if a cri actually a crime had been committed, it was to be settled by the church. Now Jesus touched on this. He addressed this to a certain extent in Matthew chapter 18. I want you to go over there with me, please. Matthew chapter 18. We got anything online? I told you Dan and Chester. Yes, yes, yes. The yes, ungers yes. are here hey, good, and Miss Trixie Joe is Yay. here. Yay, hey girl, I'm glad you made it. Man, what a good group. Uh -huh. Excellent. Praise God. Awesome. Well, we're going to Matthew chapter 18, if you just hopped on board, and we're going to look at a couple of things Jesus said about the church exercising judgment. And let me say this before we read out of Matthew chapter 18, because there's something I want to bring out here. Uh, we've already um, touched on this to a certain extent. The church was to be a place of judgment. And it was to be a place where the saints uh, decided issues and cases and so on. But even though the church was a place where uh, issues were settled, you need to realize that it was not settled by popular vote. 
In other words, the church is not a democracy. The church is a monarchy. We are part of the kingdom of God and Jesus is our king. And so even though these court cases were to be settled by the saints, the church is not people ruled. The church is Jesus ruled. And so uh, the point of the matter is, is that when the judgment of the church uh, was, was done, when, when, it, when a judgment was made by the, the local assembly, the, the judgment was to be an enforcement of what Jesus or what the Word of God has already stated. We are to enforce the laws of the kingdom, in other words. Now, Jesus touched on that in Matthew chapter 18, beginning in verse 15. And he says, Moreover, if your brother shall trespass against you, go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. If he will hear you, you have gained your brother. Now, mm -hmm. for where we're going tonight, it's important that you understand that if you've got a problem with a brother's sister, and it's something that really needs to be dealt with, the first thing you need to do is not call pastor. The first thing you need to do is go settle it between you and your brother or your sister. And when you go to settle the issue, you need to go in the right spirit. You need to go in the right attitude. And the right spirit is not, you know what, I'm going to go over to their house and I'm going to straighten their day up for them. I'm just going to tell them blah, 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 blah. No, that's the wrong spirit. That's the wrong attitude. The reason you're going to talk to your brother is because you desire to reconcile. I want to get this fixed. I don't want any strife between us. I don't want any problems. I want this reconciled, and I don't care what it takes. I want to tell you something. Strife is too high a price to pay. <coughs> it's just that simple. Strife is too costly. And so when you have an issue, and you're going to go to your, your fellow believer and get this straightened out, you're going with the attitude of reconciliation. Verse 16. But if he will not hear you, then take with you one or two, take with thee one or two more, that in the mouth of two or three witnesses every word may be established. Take one or two with you. Let them set in on the conversation. Maybe there's something you're missing. Maybe your, your vision is a little narrow and you need some input. So you take with you two or three witnesses. Again, the whole purpose of the thing is not to straighten the guy out, and it's not the two or three witnesses is not uh, for the purpose of of uh, getting a team of people together <laughs> to go straighten brother, or sister, so and so out. The objective again is reconciliation. Again, but if he will not hear you, verse sixteen, then take with you one or two more that in the mouth of two or three witnesses every word may be established. Established, And if he neglect to hear them, tell it to the church. Tell it to the ecclesia. Now that word ecclesia is very important. We won't go into it tonight, but you go back to the previous webcasts and, and read or, or watch uh, where we discuss the, the word ecclesia. He said, tell it to the church or the ecclesia. But if he neglect to hear the church, let him be unto thee as a heathen man and a publican. In other words, uh, break fellowship. Have nothing to do with this individual. At this point, it does not matter who's right or wrong. What matters is you have to isolate the strife. You have to, you've got a brother or sister now that's walking disorderly with the church and that has to be isolated and so you're to treat him as a heathen or a publican in other words break fellowship and we'll deal more with that as we go verse let me interrupt you right now because okay. we need to isolate something right now okay we've got another intruder and let me just say to you you will get nowhere here and your foul language is unacceptable so I bind up the spirit of distraction 
and the disruptive spirit in Jesus' name. Yes, amen. You foul, ungodly yes. thing, I bind you up in from operating against this webcast, against everyone. I want yes. everybody that's online chat with us, start praying in the Holy Ghost. Yes. Let's bind this thing up. You're not going to get anywhere. Jesus. You're not going to disrupt what God is doing. Yes. In the, in name, the name of Jesus. Of Jesus. No. You foul ever. spirit, you're bound. Yes. Get off and stay off. Yes. If you want to come to Jesus, we can help you do that. But if you don't stop, it will not be good on your end because you are coming against the Spirit of God. Yes. Not a good thing. Not a good thing. No. No. Amen. So let's just thank the Lord that we have the power and yes. the ability mm -hmm. to stand in the name of Jesus. Yes. Thank you. And Lord. we agree together mm -hmm. that this foul spirit is bound up in Jesus' name. Will not be interrupted and will not be disrupted. Yes, Lord. Will not be distracted in the name of we Jesus. Just give you the Thank you, Lord. Lord. Resotoro satala manaka rushkut shurbaka. Tulamana kiribe keshkut shuri kaskat salabaraka. Shon son salari kushkat sharma karbaka. It skalamana kuske satsa. Loske lo monokoto. Ureshtakara susko. Esta. Ostende de shushka. Ostede. 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 Iskala mana kara sutse. Iskala mana kara kuruko skuskutse. Solo mana kata ti sombara shatala berikis kasa. Rosatala mana. In the name of Jesus, you're isolated yes. and bound up from operating against this ministry yes. and against this webcast in the name of the in Lord Jesus, Jesus Christ. Name. Amen. Amen. All right, verse 18. Or verse 17 says, And if he neglect to hear them, ne neglect to hear them, tell it to the, to the church. But if he neglect to hear the church, let him be unto thee as a heathen man and a publican. Verily I say unto you, Whatsoever you shall bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. Whatsoever you shall loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Again I say unto you that if two of you shall agree on earth as touching anything that they shall ask, it shall be done for them of my Father which is in heaven. For where two or three are gathered together in my name. There am I in the midst of them. Now, these verses from verse 18 through verse 20 has often been used for prayer, and certainly God has, has honored that, the prayer of agreement, the mm -hmm. prayer of binding and loosing. God has honored that. Mm -hmm. But you need to realize the context of this, what Jesus said here is not prayer. The context of what Jesus said here is dealing with judgment in the church and again verse 18 Jesus said verily I say unto you whatsoever you shall bind on earth shall be bound in heaven whatsoever you shall loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven but the amplified brings out the Greek in a much clearer way and I want you to notice the tense take note of this in the Greek text the amplified says truly I tell you Whatever you forbid and declare to be improper and unlawful on earth must be what is already forbidden in heaven, and whatever you permit and declare proper and lawful on earth must be what is already permitted in heaven. Now, the reason I'm bringing this out is because I want you to realize, again, that the church's decisions of judgment are not based on man's opinions. They're not based on men's ideas. They are based on what God has already said. So I wanted that established before we go any further and on uh, where we're headed. It's not based on men's ideas, men's opinions, men's judgment, or even the current culture. It's based on God's Word. Now, um, one of the things that we've talked about, is there anything else we need to deal with online? No, I think um, our intruder has gone away. Okay. And everybody's amening. Okay. And All right. So Good. 
We're good. All right. In order to exercise spiritual judgment, whether individually or collectively, uh, God has made available to us the anointing and the office of kingship. And we've already talked about, but I want to give you the scriptures again, about the fact that you and I have been made kings and priests unto God. First of all, in Revelation chapter 1, verses 5 and 6, says, And from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness, and the first begotten of the dead, and the prince of the kings of the earth, unto him that loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood, and has made us kings and priests unto God and his Father, to him be glory and dominion for ever and ever. Amen. Again, notice in verse 6, we've been made kings and priests unto God. In Revelation chapter 5, verses 9 and 10, this is the song of the redeemed. And if you're redeemed by the blood of Jesus, this is talking about you. Revelation chapter 5, verses 9 and 10 says, And they sung a new song, saying, Thou art worthy to take the book and to open the seals thereof, and for, for thou wast slain and has redeemed us to God by thy blood out of every kindred and tongue and people and nation and has made us unto our God kings and priests. Look at that last part. We shall reign on the earth. Mm -hmm. So this is not something that's going to happen when we get to heaven. This is something that we walk in now in the earth. Again, 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 9, last scripture, says, But you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, mm -hmm. a holy nation, a peculiar people, mm -hmm. that you should show forth the praises of him, of him who has called us out of darkness into his marvelous light. Now, in Romans chapter 14, I want you to go over there with me, please. Romans chapter 14 this is a very well-known verse of Scripture. But what, what I did not realize until just a week or so ago, this is actually a description of the kingly anointing. And so I want to share this with you. I don't remember. I think we talked about it last week. Uh, but I want to bring it up to you again. In fact, we probably in this study... I think we did. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think we did too. Uh, we're going to be using this verse, um, I think, quite a bit in this study as we go. I think it actually will form a kind of a, a secondary outline of where the Lord wants to take us. But Romans chapter 14 and verse 17 says, For the kingdom of God... Again, we're dealing with a kingdom... For the kingdom of God is not meat and drink, but righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Ghost. Now, one of the things that I shared with you about the king's anointing, the king is anointed to do three things. The king is anointed to rule or to judge. He's anointed to rule or to judge, number one. Number two, the king is anointed to build. He's anointed to build. And number three, he's anointed to fight or to war. We've got a very interesting, I don't want to go into it and get off track here, We've actually got an interesting combination in the fact that we're kings and priests because kings are anointed to war and priests are not. <laughs> so sometimes we have to find out which anointing is applicable in a given situation. But kings are anointed to rule, kings are anointed to build, and kings are anointed to fight or to war. Now, I wanted to give that to you specifically in this order because I want you to see this. He said here, the kingdom of God is not meat and drink, but righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Ghost. Righteousness is the anointing of the king to judge. Righteousness is the anointing of the king to judge.
to judge. In Psalm 72, verses 1 and 2, the Bible says, Give the king your judgments, O God, and your righteousness unto the king's son. He shall judge your people with righteousness and your poor with judgment. So righteousness is the anointing of the king to judge. And when you, when you make that connection between righteousness and judgment, you're going to begin to see all kinds of verses in both the Old and the New Testament that join righteousness and judgment together. But I just wanted you to take note of Psalm 72, 1 and 2, and I want you to realize again that righteousness is the anointing of the king to judge. Secondly, he said righteousness and peace. Peace is the anointing of the king to build. Peace is the anointing of the king to build. In 1 Chronicles chapter 22, verses 7 through 10, David gives his testimony and he gives God's dealing with him concerning the building of the temple. 1 Chronicles 22, verses 7 through 10, it says, And David said to Solomon, My son, as for me, it was in my mind to build a house under the name of the Lord my God. And the word of the Lord came to me saying, you, shall, you have shed blood abundantly and has made great wars. You shall not build a house unto my name because you have shed much blood upon the earth in my sight. Now, it, David was not wrong in all of his fights. He was not wrong in the shedding of blood. He was anointed to fight as a king. He said in the Psalms, God taught my hands to fight. He taught me to war. But what God is saying to him is you don't carry that anointing to build. You are a king. David was a marvelous judge. He had that anointing of righteousness to judge. But he did not have that anointing of peace to build. However, he did have the anointing to fight or to war. But he goes on to say what the Lord said to him. He said, Behold, a son shall be born to you who shall be a man of rest. And I will give him rest from all of his enemies round about, for his name shall be Solomon, which the word Solomon comes from is a derivative of shalom, which means peace. And I will give peace and quietness unto Israel in his days. He shall build a house for my name, and he shall be my son, and I will be his father, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom over Israel forever. And so it's interesting. David was anointed to fight. Solomon was not anointed to fight. Now Solomon had a very powerful army because uh, he was a very wealthy man and he built up a very powerful army that nobody wanted to mess with and also a very powerful navy. It's very similar to the United States. We put a lot of money into the military and rightfully so and because of that we're the most powerful nation on earth militarily. And the same thing was true in Solomon's day. He was a man of peace, but he had a very strong, very strong military. Who was it? Theodore Roosevelt said, speak softly and carry a big stick. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, Solomon had a big stick. <laughs> and so anyway, be that as it may, I want you to realize that the anointing, to, to, the anointing of peace is the anointing of the king to build. And then lastly says righteousness, peace, and joy. Joy is the anointing of the king to fight. And I hope we can get over into this later. I'm, I'm starting to get glimpses of, of that. Uh, it's, very, it's a very interesting uh, study to connect joy to spiritual warfare. But James chapter 1 verses 1 and 2 gives us a, gives us a little glimpse into the relationship James 1, 1 and 2 says, James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the twelve tribes which are scattered abroad, greeting. My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into diverse temptations or tests and trials or when the enemy comes against you. This Greek word, temptations, <coughs> refers to the, the attacks of the enemy. 
the tests and trials of the enemy. And he says here, when the tests and trials come, count it all joy. In other words, uh, when those tests and trials come, it's not time to lay down. It's not time to compromise. It's not time to quit. It's time to stand up and fight. But you're not to fight in your own strength and in your own ability. There's the anointing of the king to fight, which is the joy of the Lord. Now, um, I want you to go with me, please, to Isaiah chapter 11. Did Isaiah I tell you 11. Wade is here? No. Hey, brother, I'm glad you're here. Excellent. Thank you for being here. It's good here. to have you, Wade. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, all of that that I've, we've just talked about has been review. So now we're going to go into some things. I want you to look up Isaiah chapter 11. We're going to talk about uh, the anointing of the king to judge or righteousness. And so look up Isaiah 11 because I want to... Um, clarify some things and maybe shift your thinking about some things and again righteousness is the anointing of the king to rule or to judge now um, I want to remind you of something um, well I, apparently I didn't put it in the yes here it is um, well, let me let me back up and do do it this way. Righteousness is the anointing to judge as a king. We got over into this last week, so my question to you is: my first question to you is: Are you righteous? Well, absolutely, you are righteous. And, of course, you're familiar with 2 Corinthians 5.21. says, talking about God the Father, For he, God the Father, hath made him, Jesus, to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Well, if you've been made the righteousness of God, you are certainly a king and a priest before God, and you carry an anointing to judge or to rule okay with that said I want to remind you of something that happened in the Old Testament um, in 1st Samuel chapter 8 you don't need to, to go there but in 1st Samuel chapter 8 the nation of Israel um, really a, applied a lot of pressure on God. Somebody said, you mean you can apply pressure on God? Absolutely you can. Uh, you can, if you have a covenant with God, which you do, you can work things in such a way that you kind of hem God into a corner. I mean, it's kind of like we were talking about a couple of weeks ago when uh, Peter was in the boat and Jesus was walking on the water and Peter said, if it's you bidding me come, well, you know, what's he going to say? <laughs> he kind of hemmed in. Mm -hmm. And you can hem God in, in in certain areas. And it's a dangerous thing to do, but you can do it. And the nation of Israel hemmed God in uh, regarding a king. They wanted a king. And... Uh, Samuel was upset about it because he knew that Israel was out of line. But God said, uh, give him a king. Well, now, why did he say that? Because he had a covenant with Israel. And under that, the, the covenant terms, he was obligated to give them what they wanted. And so and Sam, and Samuel was upset about it. And God told Samuel, he said, don't be upset. He said, they haven't rejected you. They've rejected me. So anyway, they got a king, and their king, as you know, the first king of Israel was King Saul. And Saul was not God's man. Saul was not God's choice. Saul was man's choice. And of course, Saul uh, disobeyed God and uh, rebelled against God. It was more than just a disobedience. It was a rebellion against God. And so 
God said, you've rebelled against me. Rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft. I'm going to take the kingdom from you. And so God spoke to Samuel. And he said, I want you to go down to Jesse's house. And he said, I want you to uh, choose. A, I want you to anoint a man that I have chosen. I have anointed a king for myself. And I want you to anoint him. And of course, we know that this was David. But when Samuel went down to Jesse's house, uh, Jesse presented his sons from the oldest to the youngest. And of course, then uh, it's very interesting. I really appreciate Samuel. He was a man of faith because he went through the sons of Jesse and God kept saying, this is not the one, this is not the one, this is not the one. And he got down to the to the last son and God said this is not the one and I think it's remarkable because Samuel didn't say oh I must have missed God oh I missed God no he didn't say that he just told Jesse he said you got any more kids <laughs> mm -hmm. and I think that's great and sure mm -hmm. enough there was David and I don't have time to go into all that but in the process of this like I said Jesse was the first one Jesse presented his, his sons from the oldest to the least. And the first one that was presented was his son by the name of Eliab. And Eliab was a very uh, good-looking man. He was, he was a very, uh, he looked kingly. He looked the part, just like Saul. Saul looked the part. The Bible says Saul was head and shoulders above every man in Israel. So Saul looked the part. But he wasn't God's choice, and his heart was not right. And so here we are in 1 Samuel 16, in verse 6. 16. 16. Did I not say that? What did I say? I wrote down 8. Oh, no, 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 no. <laughs> that, that's just part of my story. Okay. 1 <laughs> Samuel 16, and we got it here on screen. <clears throat> it says, And it came to pass when they were come that he looked on Eliab and said, Surely... This, the Lord's anointed, is before him. In other words, man, this has got to be the guy. I mean, he just looks the part. But the Lord said unto Samuel, Look not on his countenance or on the height of his stature, because I have refused him. For the Lord seeth not as man sees. For man looks on the outward appearance, but God looks on the heart. You've probably heard the last part of that scripture through the years. For the Lord sees not as man sees, for man looks on the outward appearance, but God looks on the heart. Now, um, one of the things that we know about God is that God is omniscient, which means God is all-knowing. God knows everything. We know that. Here's my question. God's ability to look on the heart. Does it come from God's omniscience? The, God's ability to look into man and see into his heart. Does that come from God's omniscience? Now, I don't know about you, but I thought for years that it, that it was. But as I've studied this out and looked at it, I've begun to realize certainly God is omniscient. I'm not taking away from that. God knows everything. But God's ability to see into another person's heart or see into the heart of a man does not come from his omniscience. God's ability to see into the heart of a man comes from his righteousness righteousness carries a discernment with it let me say this again God sees into the heart of a human being based on righteousness Psalm 7 and verse 9 I forgot to put it in let me just read it to you 
Psalm 7 and verse 9. It says, Oh, let the wickedness of the wicked come to an end, but establish the righteous. For the righteous God tries the hearts and the reins. Let me read that again. Oh, let the wickedness of the wicked come to an end, but establish the righteous. For the righteous God tries the hearts and, and the reins. So God's ability to see into a human being comes from righteousness. Now, one thing, something else you need to realize is there it will come a day when God will judge every human being. No one will be exempt. But what I want you to realize is that that judgment will not be directly from God himself. It will be done through Jesus. Now, uh, in John chapter 5 and verse 22, Jesus said this. He said, For the Father judges no man, but has committed all judgment to the Son. So Jesus is the one that will administrate the judgment of God. But I want you to notice this. In Acts chapter 17 and verse 31, Paul is preaching. And he's talking about God. And he says, Because He, God, has appointed a day in the which He will judge the world in righteousness by that man that's important take note of that by that man whom he has ordained whereof <clears throat> he has given assurance unto all men in that he has raised him from the dead let me read it again because he has appointed a day in which he will judge the world in righteousness by that man whom he has ordained, whereof he has given assurance unto all men, and that he has raised him from the dead. Now, why is that important? Well, there's a couple of reasons that that's important. First of all, <clears throat> it's important because you need to recognize the justice of God here. God is going to administrate his judgment through Jesus. And the reason that that is important is because um, God is, in this judgment, God will be closing the door on anybody that would try to stand up and say, well, God, <clears throat> you, really, you really don't have the right to judge me because you've never been a human being. You've never been where I am. You've never been sick. You've never been in pain. You've never been tempted. The Bible says that. God, God has never been tempted with evil and does not tempt with evil. God, you've never been tempted. God, you don't know what it's like here. You don't know what it's like to be a human being. Well, God is closing the door on that because the judgment on man will be administrated by the man who has experienced everything that can be experienced by any human being there's not one single thing that you and i have experienced that jesus hasn't gone through mm -hmm. jesus has covered the whole gamut of human experience he went to the lowest deepest darkest pit of hell and now he is seated at the right hand of the father he has been as low as a human being can go he's now as high as a human being can go and he's been there, done that. And you're not going to be able to stand up and say, well, Jesus, you just don't understand. He understands better than we do. So Jesus is going to be the administrator of that judgment. Now, Isaiah chapter 11. 
We got anything online? Uh, Tony and Sandra, <coughs> David was a man of war, but his son Solomon was in the time of peace, and that is when God builds righteousness. That's right. Lucille says, does assurance unto all men mean that all men will have the assurance of being judged with righteous judgment? Well, there's, there's actually, there's, there's two things that the last part of that verse, it says, whereof he hath, he hath given assurance unto all men in that he has raised him from the dead. In other words, the resurrection is the assurance that that will be the means of judgment for all of humanity. Uh, the Bible says that Jesus has been raised from the dead so that he will be the judge of the quick and the dead. In other words, the whole spectrum of humanity, living, dead, everybody will be judged through Jesus. And the assurance of that is the resurrection. So that's yeah. what that's... In that he <coughs> finished He finished the it work. all, did it all, mm -hmm. so he's judgeable. And the resurrection is the assurance of that. Or nobody, the guarantee. The guarantee of mm -hmm. it, exactly. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Okay, okay. anything she else? She said, okay, got it. Okay. All right, Isaiah chapter 11 and verse 1. Now this is talking about Jesus coming as king, and as king he's going to be judge as a man, as a man. Isaiah 11 verse 1 says, And there shall come forth a rod out of the stem of Jesse, and a branch shall grow out of his roots, and the Spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him. The spirit of wisdom and understanding, <coughs> pardon me, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and of the fear of the Lord, and shall make him of quick understanding in the fear of the Lord, and he shall judge after the, he, and he shall not judge after the sight of his eyes, neither reprove after the hearing of his ears, but with righteousness shall he judge the poor and reprove with equity for the meek of the earth. And he shall smite the earth with the rod of his mouth and with the breath of his lips shall he slay the wicked and righteousness shall be the girdle of his loins and faithfulness the girdle of his reins. I want you to see what that's saying here. Jesus is not going to judge after appearance. You remember what God said to Samuel? I don't judge after appearance. I see man's heart. And Jesus, because of that anointing of righteousness that is upon him, he will not judge by appearance. He won't judge after his eyes or after his ears. He will be able to see into the hearts of each and every one of us. Why? Because of righteousness. And so I want you to realize again that righteousness is what allows us to see beyond the natural, to see beyond the circumstance and look into the hearts of people that are involved in a given situation. In John chapter 7 and verse 24, Jesus summed it up this way. He told the Jewish leaders of his day, he said, Judge not according to the appearance, but what? Judge righteous judgment. So righteousness gives us an ability to see into. It gives us a discernment to see into men's hearts, men's lives, and make a judgment. And so that's what we're going to talk about for the next few minutes. And I want you to go with me to two places. I want you to go with me to Romans chapter 2 and also to John chapter 8. Romans chapter 2 and John chapter 8. Have we got anything uh -uh. online? Okay. Everybody listening. All right. Romans chapter 2 and John chapter 8. Well, let me just share that first of all, we need to establish what we are not, or let me rephrase. We're going to establish what is not the yardstick of our measurement. This is not the yardstick of our measurement. Um, 
Romans chapter 2. Paul is writing, verse 1, beginning in verse 1, he is writing in the, in the second chapter of Romans to the Jew, who is under the law, under the Ten Commandments. And in Romans chapter 2 and verse 1, he says this to the Jew. He said, Therefore you are inexcusable, O man, whosoever you are that, ju that judgest. For wherein you judge another, you condemn yourself. For you that judge do the same things. But we are sure that the judgment of God is according to truth against them which commit such things. Now, <clears throat> first of all, we cannot judge by the letter of the law. We cannot exercise judgment by the letter of the law. I want to give you four reasons why. We cannot, now I'm talking about the judgment that's to flow through the church, the judgment of God that flows in the church, to the church, and through the church. All right. First of all, we do not judge according to the letter of the law, number one, because we are not under the law, we are under grace. Romans chapter 6 and verse 14 says, For sin shall not have dominion over you, for you are not under the law but under grace. Now at some point, I don't know who's watching this or who will watch this on archive, but I want to tell you, my dear brother and sister, at some point we have to settle the issue that we are in no way, no fashion, no how under the law. Period. I understand types and shadows and patterns. I get that. And we learn a lot from those. But one of the problems that I see in the body of Christ that's being presented in the name of Jewish roots, I see Judaizing re-emerging mm -hmm. in the last days, trying to bring God's people back under <coughs> the law. And the problem is... Yes, our, we are rooted, and we are grafted in. We are the wild olive tree that's been grafted in, and we are rooted. But our roots are not in Moses. Our roots are in Abraham, and Abraham was under grace, and he walked with God by faith, and we're required to do the same thing. We are not rooted in Moses. We are rooted in Abraham. And Abraham was 400 years before the law. So, we don't judge based on the letter of the law because we're not under law, but under grace. Number two, the letter of the law has only one outcome, and that is condemnation and death. There's, I mean, there's just no other way out. In 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 6 through 9, Paul is talking about the law. <clears throat> He's talking about the letter of the law. In 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 6 through 9, he said, Who also made us able ministers of the New Testament, not of the letter, but of the Spirit, for the letter kills but the spirit gives life but if the ministration or the administration of death written and engraven in stones the law administers death but if the administration of death written and engraven in stones was glorious so that the children of Israel could not steadfastly behold the face of Moses for the glory of his countenance which glory was to be done away how shall not the administration of the Spirit be rather glorious? For the, if the administration of condemnation be glory, much more does the administration of righteousness. Did you catch it? That the administration of righteousness excel in glory. We are not under the law. The law has only one outcome, and that is condemnation and death. And scripture is very clear 
that there is no mercy under the law. So we can't exercise judgment under the law. Again, number one, because we're not under the law. Number two, the letter of the law has only one outcome, which is condemnation and death. Number three, we have no right to judge someone else by the laws that we have broken. <laughs> we have no right to judge someone else by the laws that we have broken. And there is not one single human being apart from the Lord Jesus Christ of Nazareth who has not broken at least one of the Ten Commandments. And so we have no right to judge someone else by laws that we have broken. And in James chapter 2 and verse 10, <clears throat> James talks about that and he says, For whosoever shall keep the whole law. <laughs> Man, that'd be the pits to live 80, 90 years and never break one single commandment, get down to the last day and then break one. Mm -hmm. Wouldn't that be the pits? Right down to the wire. And right then down to the wire and blow one. <laughs> mess up big time. <laughs> the reason for that is because Paul uh, James said, whosoever shall keep the whole law and yet offend in one point, he's guilty of all. Mm -hmm. You can't keep the law. You just, there's not any way to do it. And so since we can't keep the law, so you should just, but Jesus kept the law. Uh-huh, he did. But I'm going to tell you something. Jesus didn't keep the law by keeping the law. What? <laughs> <laughs> Jesus kept the law by fulfilling it. What? You, what? <laughs> Jesus kept the law by fulfilling it. Jesus didn't keep the law by keeping the law. He kept the law by walking in love, and when you walk in love, you fulfill the law. And he never stepped out of love, not one time. So, anyhow, whoever shall keep the whole law and yet offend in one point, he is guilty of all. So we have no right to judge anybody by a law that we have broken. And number four, and you're going to see this as we go into John 8. Number four, the law can only judge after the flesh. It can only judge the act. The law can only judge after the flesh. It can only judge the act. The law is cut and dried, black and white. It's real simple. You did it. You're guilty. You die. Period. No mercy, no leniency, nothing. Just, you're done. So again, these four things. We cannot judge by the writ letter of the law. Number one, we're not under the law, but under grace. Number two, the letter of the law has only one outcome, condemnation and death. Number three, we have no right to judge someone else by the laws we've broken. And number four, the law can only judge after the flesh. It can only judge the act now go with me to John chapter 8 <clears throat> we got anything online let's see Lucille <laughs> black and white <laughs> my kind of <laughs> law ha. she says not only have we broken at least one of the ten commandments of the Old Testament I'm sure a number of us have failed miserably by not walking in the New Testament law to walk in love Absolutely, all of us have yeah. missed it in the love walk. Yeah. All of us. Yeah. But there's, there's, there's two things about, about that. Number one, um, when God gave the law, he knew man couldn't keep it. That was part of the foundation of the whole sacrificial system. And um, the law apart from sacrifice provided no way out and as the book of Hebrews teaches that didn't even do away with the sin it just covered it for a year mm -hmm. until Jesus came now the mm -hmm. thing about walking in love yes it is our commandment but the blood of Jesus has been shed 
and there is reprieve and there is mercy and there is reconciliation in that love commandment. Mm -hmm. But when it comes to the law, and again, going back to James 2.10, and <clears throat> Brother Derek Prince does tremendous teaching on this, but I want to emphasize this. I said it Sunday. Whosoever shall keep the whole law and yet offend in one point, he is guilty of all. Now, in, in writing this, James is writing to Jewish Christians. You can read it in the first part of his, his letter. He is writing to Jewish believers, and they understand this, that the law is one complete system. And you can't take this part and get rid of this part, and we'll keep this and then get rid of this. And, you know, so he said, well, yeah, we're supposed to keep the Ten Commandments, okay? Then why do we meet on Sunday instead of Saturday? Mm -hmm. The Sabbath was a, one of the big ten. And so we pick and we choose as Christians. Well, this, this, is, this is for today and that's not for today. And, and none of it applies because it's one complete law. It's one complete system that is, it belongs to Israel. It's part of the covenant with Israel. Israel. It's not part of our covenant. Our covenant is not with Moses. Our covenant is with Abraham. The new covenant is the extension not of the Mosaic covenant, but of the Abrahamic covenant. Mm -hmm. So, it's a mm -hmm. two totally different things. Mm -hmm. so. Trixie says, I was just thinking along those same lines, Lucille. Praise God that Jesus redeemed us. Because I know for a fact there has been a time or two where I failed the love commandment. <laughs> uh, then he says the law can be corrupted. Natural law, that is. Mm -hmm. Exactly. God's law is perfect. The law of the Lord is perfect. Yep. Converting the soul. It is perfect. Men's laws are corrupt. God's law is not. The problem with the law is we're corrupt. Mm -hmm. That's the problem with the law. Mm -hmm. So, and Paul dealt with that in Romans chapter 7. Mm -hmm. And when you compare <coughs> yourself to the absolute love of God, it, you see how very far we are from that fullness. That's why we have to continue in the Word. Mm -hmm. That's why we have to continue mm -hmm. with fellowship with one another mm -hmm. to continue in that love and, mm -hmm. and grow in it mm -hmm. and grow up in it. Mm -hmm. You don't start out just doing it. Mm -hmm. It's a process. That's right. It is a process. But the thing about the the uh, the love of God and and we're going to this is where we're headed when you begin to exercise judgment as the church individually and collectively and you do it in the love of God then you begin to judge based on righteousness and when you begin to do that then it's no longer a matter of well I'm judging this one and I'm judging that one you become the conduit, and we're going to see this in just a moment, that the judgment is not yours, but God's. You're simply a conduit of that judgment. Mm -hmm. You're not judging anybody. You're a conduit of what God has already judged. Mm -hmm. And only love can do that. Mm -hmm. So, amen. You got something? <laughs> okay, anything else? Uh, Lucille says, growing in the love of God is exactly what I was thinking. And it is a continual growing process mm -hmm. of growing up. Let us grow up into Him. Mm -hmm. And we'll never stop doing that on no. this earth. No. As long as we're on this earth. No. And I, I, I truly believe that we'll continue to learn it in heaven. Oh, absolutely we will. We won't have the obstacles, mm -hmm. the barriers of the flesh and things of that nature. Yeah. Obviously the devil won't be there. But... Yeah. The thing about growing in the love of God, and we're going to see this before we get through, the more we grow in the love of God, the more it develops our ability to discern. 
mm-hmm. and to judge mm-hmm. and do it right. Mm-hmm. Well, you see into things and you see into people akin to what God does. You see beyond what you see and you hear beyond what you hear and you know beyond what you know and you know that you know that by the Spirit of God and it's not a fleshly judgment. It is a knowing on the inside of you. That discernment comes by the Spirit of God and He will entrust us with that the more we are developed and grow up in Him. Mm -hmm. The more we develop and mature and grow up in the love of God, in the things of God, Mm -hmm. and we choose his love over being right Mm -hmm. or having an opinion or expressing (laughs) that opinion, Mm -hmm. um, most people don't care what you think. Truly. They really don't. They honestly don't care what you think. And, and I have to say, I reciprocate for the most part. <laughs> yes. Um, <laughs> the more you walk in love and the more you walk with God, the less you care what people think and the less you care about what they think. Mm-hmm. Did I get that right? Mm-hmm. You just It's like, well, okay, but I've got another standard. I've got another judge that's exactly right then I'm going to find out from the judge mm-hmm. what's right and mm-hmm. wrong because mm-hmm. it's his judgment not ours mm-hmm. and that just eliminates a whole lot of unnecessary trying to figure things out and having an opinion and getting caught up in the drama and mm-hmm. you just flat don't care yeah and if the Lord wants you to know something, you wait. Lord, you can tell me if you want me to know something. Otherwise, I'm going to walk on like everything's all mm-hmm. hunky-dory. Exactly. Amen. 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 All right. John chapter 8. You guys all know this story. <clears throat> it says, Jesus went unto the Mount of Olives, and early in the morning he came again unto the temple. And all the people came unto him, and he sat down and taught them. And the scribes and Pharisees brought unto him a woman taken in adultery. And when they had set her in the midst, they say unto him, Master, this woman was taken in adultery in the very act. Now Moses in the law commanded us that such should be stoned, but what sayest thou? Thank God they got him on the case. (laughs) This they said, tempting him, that they might have to accuse him. But Jesus stooped down and with his finger wrote on the ground as though he heard them not. So when they continued asking him, he lifted up himself and said unto them, He that is without sin among you, let him first cast a stone at her. Now he was exercising the principle that we just got through talking about. And he, in essence, he was establishing the fact that you have no right to judge someone by law that you yourself have broken. And so he was saying to these people, okay, you want to judge her by the law? Jesus is just smart. (laughs) He said, you want to judge her by the law? Fine. Then which one of you has not broken it? You can throw the first rock if you've not broken the law. And again, he stooped down and wrote on the ground. And they which heard it, being convicted by their own conscience, went out one by one, beginning at the eldest, even unto the last. And Jesus was left alone and the woman standing in the midst. Now, there's a couple of things here. First of all, These people did not give a flip about the law. They didn't care anything about this woman. She was nothing but a pawn in this whole thing. Because they, and and it said that, said they did this whole, put this whole scenario together that they might have to accuse Jesus. They're interested in one thing, and that's destroying him. And we're going to touch on this in just a moment before we get through. But you can never exercise proper judgment when you have a wrong motive. Mm -hmm. You just can't do it. 
I don't care how many scriptures you can quote. I mean, they could have sat there and Bible thumped all day long. Yeah, but it says right there. I don't care. Your motive is wrong. And your, if your motive is wrong, then your judgment will be wrong. You're, not, you're outside of love. You're outside of love, exactly. Even though the theology is correct. The letter of the law is correct. Mm -hmm. The letter of the law is judging the act. Mm -hmm. But the fact that you're trying to accuse puts you in the camp of the devil. That's right. The accuser of the brethren. That's right. That's exactly You become right. cohorts with him. Yeah. And that takes it out of the love realm. And it doesn't matter how right you are, you're wrong. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Exactly. It just, won't, it just won't work. And so uh, Jesus is addressing this situation. Another element, too, is they broke the law before they ever got off the ground because you can go back to the book of Deuteronomy and find out. The book of Deuteronomy says is that if, if there is a couple caught in the act, then you bring the couple out, the man and the woman out, and you stone mm -hmm. both of them. Well, where was the guy? Somebody said, well, this was just a setup. Well, to a certain extent, yes. But this woman did commit adultery because Jesus told her, she, he told her, he said, go and sin no more. So somebody else was there. Where was he? Maybe he was one of the one with the rocks. Maybe he ran out the door. We don't know. But the whole situation is out of line and out of order because these people are trying to, again, accuse, accuse Jesus and they're trying to use the letter of the law to condemn an act. And they want Jesus to do one of two things. If, if they say, if he says don't kill her, then they violate, then he supposedly violated the law and he's guilty. If he says go ahead and kill her, then he's showing no mercy. I mean, it's a catch-22 anyway you go. So, verse 8. Well, verse 7, so when they continued asking him, he lifted up himself and said unto them, I just, man, he's just sharp. He that is without sin among you, let him first cast a stone at her. And again, he stooped down and wrote on the ground. And they which heard it being convicted by their own conscience went out one by one, beginning at the eldest, even unto the last. And Jesus was left alone and the woman standing in the midst. So now here's this woman. She's been publicly humiliated. Uh, she's been used as a pawn in this whole thing. And the one guy who actually has the right to throw the first rock is standing right there. <laughs> and when Jesus had lifted up himself and saw none but the woman, <laughs> he said unto her, Woman, where are your accusers? And it goes back to what he said. They, they were wanting to accuse Mm -hmm. Woman, where are your accusers? Has no man condemned thee? Well, now she's standing there looking in Jesus' face. That is a question that however she answers is very important. And uh, because the question in her mind would be, uh, okay, uh, I know you're a prophet. Uh, uh, what are you going to do? You know? <laughs> But I want you to hear the faith coming out of this woman's mouth. Woman, where are thine accusers? Has no man condemned thee? Verse 11. She said, no man, Lord. Now that's a statement of faith because she didn't know what Jesus was going to do and she called him Lord. No man, Lord. And Jesus said unto her, neither do I condemn you. Go, uh, neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. Now, from here on out, there's a conversation. You go through the whole eighth chapter and read the conversation that now takes place between Jesus and the Jewish leadership, and it's all rooted in this event. But he goes on to say this. says, Then spake Jesus again unto them, saying, I am the light of the world. He that followeth after me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. So what is that? It's a discernment. Mm -hmm. It's a discernment. He's just mm -hmm. judged her case. It's a discernment. Mm -hmm. The Pharisees therefore said unto him, You bear record of yourself. Your record is not true. In other words, well, you may have, we 
you know, we give, gave the case to you and, and you're saying you're walking in light. You're not walking in light. You just let her go. Jesus answered and said unto them, Though I do bear record of myself, yet my record is true. For I know whence I came and whither I go, but you cannot tell whence I am and whither I go. You judge after the flesh. And what were they doing? Judging after the law. You judge after the flesh. I judge no man. And I, I told everybody the other day, in your Bible, you may want to put out there in your margin where he said, I judge no man. You may want to put out there in parentheses after the flesh. Because he just judged this woman's situation. It wasn't that he didn't judge. He did judge. But he didn't judge after the flesh. Verse 16. And or but if, but if I judge, and if I judge, my judgment is true. I judged correctly. If I judge, my judge, judgment is true. For I am not alone but I and the Father that sent me. What is he saying? He's saying, look, I judged this situation. I judged it correctly because the judgment was not mine, but the Father's. Mm -hmm. Well, how did he do that? He saw into that situation. He saw into the heart of those men. He saw into the heart of that woman. How? By righteousness again John 7 24 Jesus said don't judge after appearance judge righteous judgment the, the judgment comes from God and I, I shared um, Sunday and of course Dan and Shasta's on, online. Dan would know more about this than I would. He was a defense attorney for 30 years. He would say, well, you know, uh, the Bible says uh, you shall not kill. Literally, you shall do no murder. Well, murder's murder. Well, in a way, yeah, I mean, you know, you end up with the same end result. But you need to realize that there are different levels of murder. Uh, and part of the issue of going to court is finding out, okay, was this premeditated? Was this a crime of passion? Uh, was this manslaughter? Was the, And I, I gave the illustration a couple of years ago. You guys may remember in South Texas, some doofus was going down the road texting and ran over a church bus and killed everybody involved. Mm -hmm. And should he have gone to the pen? Yeah, probably did. Mm -hmm. But it was not... Like I said, it was not like some terrorist laying out in the bar ditch with a deer rifle. Totally different. He wasn't on, you know, purposely trying to go after people in a church bus. They wound up dead anyway, and he needed to be held responsible. But all of the, the factors and the circumstances and the heart motives and everything needs to be considered. And that's part of the hassle of working through a particular court case of establishing what really happened mm -hmm. for what purpose to produce a righteous judgment mm -hmm. the punishment we need to establish first of all what is the crime and number two what punishment fits the crime mm -hmm. well the point is in every situation where the church is involved righteousness is what gives us the ability to do that not the law, righteousness. Mm -hmm. Okay. So mm -hmm. I don't know if you got something or. Uh, a little while ago, Tony says love is the foundation to anything you do or don't. And Burl says hunky dory, that's a term I can appreciate. <laughs> um, I said, um, heard it all my life, don't know its origin. Trixie says it has to be a southern thing because I've heard it all my life yeah, too. It is a southern thing, uh, thing. Denny says sounds like everything you hear in the news today using someone caught in a lesser crime to attack and entrap someone they don't like. Uh, the enemy never changes. Same old attacks. Yeah, the accuser is the accuser. Lucille, if the Pharisees are left, all left, who was Jesus then talking to about his record? Did they hang on the outskirts or come back or what? 
Well, there were still there were still Jewish leaders present. The, you can read down through there and find that out. Um, there were there were spectators there. There were leaders still there. The leaders weren't necessarily the ones throwing the rocks. The leaders were the ones that was instigating the whole deal. I mean, it, mm -hmm. you, the leaders were notorious about stirring up the populace. You know, they were the ones that instigated with Jesus, the crucify him, crucify him, crucify him. They, they, and then stand back and then watch stand it happen. Stand back and just, yeah, they, they played the crowd, mm -hmm. and so that's more than likely what transpired that that mm -hmm. you know they weren't the ones that threw the rocks but they they instigated mm -hmm. the whole thing mm -hmm. um, Robert Garcia says so when the word says righteousness exalted a nation is it referring to the righteous nation of the church or the nations of the earth or both well it can refer to both but I I think in particular it refers to the nations of the earth but what that scripture says, righteousness exalts a nation, but sin is a reproach to any people. And we probably have one of the best uh, court systems in the world. And, um, you know, you can, and particularly before Congress screwed a bunch of stuff up, when back when you had the Ten Commandments hanging in the courtrooms and all that kind of stuff, and, and basically that was, that was, what we were trying to live by and our court system established on that to a certain extent um, I think there was there is righteousness in the court system again Dan would know more about this than I would I think there are a lot of good honest people that really when it comes to a crime try, try, they try to get to the, the real crime what really happened and apply the right punishment to the good or to the bad and that's righteousness exalting a nation but sin is a reproach to any people in other words uh, I don't care how righteous your court system is sin still has to be dealt with mm -hmm. so. and Frances um, let's see she was answering Lucille she said um, that the scribes and the Pharisees were the ones that left and so okay. that's it okay um, yeah, that's all the commentary. Okay. And I was thinking, you know, when the woman says to Jesus, no man, Lord, she had to have seen the mercy in his eyes because she drew on the mercy. Absolutely, she did. Absolutely. She had to perceive the mercy in him mm -hmm. because she automatically drew on the mercy. Mm -hmm. And then she spoke by faith. No man, Lord. Well, and the, and the reason that I read this, I'm glad you brought that out, because the reason that I read this is here is a woman that is guilty under the law, mm -hmm. but exonerated by the mercy and grace of God mm -hmm. because Jesus was able to discern the whole situation. And that's what we need in the church. Mm -hmm. so. mm -hmm. Amen. All right. That's it. Yeah. All right. Go with me to no. Let's let's do this. Um, let me emphasize once again what Jesus said here. Verse sixteen says, "Yet if I judge, my judgment is true, for I am not alone, but I and the Father that sent me." In other words, Jesus was saying, "I did not judge this; my Father judged it. I was just the conduit." Now, um, in order to exercise righteous judgment, first of all, we must establish the fact that the judgment comes from God and not man. And in order to do that, we must have three things, and I want to give them to you. Go with me to 2 Chronicles chapter 19. Three things that establish the judgment of God. We know we're not supposed to judge by the, the letter of the law, so what is the criteria? Now, again, we're not throwing the Bible down. That's our basis. That's our foundation. But there is a difference between judging from the letter of the law and the spirit of the law. The letter kills, but the spirit gives life. What's the purpose of all judgment? Restoration. Okay. 
What was the reference? Second Chronicles chapter 19. We're going to begin reading with verse 5. In 2 Chronicles chapter 19 and verse 5, Jehoshaphat was uh, reestablishing the court system in Israel. He was setting up judges. It was a time of revival and renewal and so on. <clears throat> verse 5 says, And he set judges in the land throughout all the fenced cities of Judah, city by city, and said to the judges, Take heed what you do. For you judge not for man, but for the Lord, who is with you in the judgment. Now that's exactly what Jesus said, talking about the woman. Wherefore, now let the fear of the Lord be upon you. Take heed and do it. For there is no iniquity with the Lord our God, nor respect of persons, nor taking of, taking of gifts. Moreover, in Jerusalem did Jehoshaphat set up, set of the Levites and of the priests and of the chiefs of the fathers of Israel for the judgment of the Lord and for controversies when they returned to Jerusalem and he charged them saying thus shall you do in the fear of the Lord faithfully and with a perfect heart so the first element that we need in order to exercise righteous judgment is the fear of the Lord the fear of the Lord the second one Let's go to 1 Kings chapter 3. 1 Kings chapter 3. First Kings chapter 3 and verse 6. This is the prayer of Solomon when he comes to the, ascends to the throne of David. Verse 6 says, And Solomon said, Thus thou hast showed unto thy, unto, my, unto thy servant David my father great mercy, according as he walked before thee in truth and in righteousness and in uprightness of heart with thee. And you have kept for him this great kindness that you have given him a son to sit on his throne as it is this day. And now, O Lord my God, you have made my, thy servant king <clears throat> instead of David my father. And I am but a little child. I know not how to go out or to come in. And thy servant is in the midst of thy people, which you have chosen a great people that cannot be numbered nor counted for multitude. Verse 9. Give, therefore, thy servant an understanding... Now you may have a different translation because actually a better translation would be give your servant a hearing heart rather than understanding. Give therefore <coughs> thy servant a hearing heart to judge thy people that I may discern between good and bad. For who is able to judge this thy so great a people and the speech pleased the Lord that Solomon had asked this thing. Now in... Uh, the account of in Second Chronicles, <coughs> he asked for wisdom. Well, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. But he asked for a hearing heart to judge. And so the first thing we need is the fear of the Lord. The second thing is a hearing heart to receive God's wisdom. <coughs> a hearing heart to receive God's wisdom. In other words, um, we need to take a clue or a key from David or from Solomon here is I'm not going to make a judgment on this till I've heard from heaven. It's not God's or our judgment, it's God's. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to make a judgment on this till I've heard from heaven. And the third thing is love. Go with me to Philippians chapter 1. <clears throat> Philippians chapter 1 and verse 
Philippians chapter 1. Philippians chapter 1, verses 9 through 11. We've looked at this before, but I want to read it to you again. To me, this is one of the most powerful prayers in all of Scripture, and it's only three verses long. And Paul prays it <clears throat> for the church at Philippi. He said, the King James says, And this I pray, that your love may abound yet more and more in knowledge and in all judgment or discernment. But both words would apply. That you may approve things that are excellent, that you may be sincere and without offense till the day of Christ, being filled with the fruits of righteousness, which are by Jesus Christ under the glory and praise of God. Now, just reading that, I think it's very interesting. <clears throat> the Lord brought this to my attention. He said here, being filled with the fruits of Jesus, being filled with the fruits of righteousness, righteousness brings discernment, which are by Jesus Christ. And Jesus Christ is the judge. The judgment is not ours, but God's. Being filled with the fruits of righteousness, which are by Jesus Christ, under the glory and praise of God. And again, I... I so blessed by the Amplified Philippians 1 9 through 11 in the Amplified says in this I pray <clears throat> that your love may abound yet more and more and extend to its fullest development in knowledge and all keen insight that your love may display itself in greater depth of acquaintance and more comprehensive discernment so that you may surely learn to sense what is vital and approve and prize what is excellent and of real value, recognizing the highest and the best and distinguishing the moral differences, and that you may be untainted and pure and unerring and blameless, so that with hearts sincere and certain and unsullied you may approach the day of Christ, not stumbling nor causing others to stumble. I think that is very, very powerful. Verse 11, may you abound in and be filled with the fruits of righteousness, of right standing with God and right doing, which comes through Jesus Christ, the anointed one, to the honor and praise of God, that his glory may be both manifested and recognized. So it's very important that we have those three things in exercising proper judgment. The fear of the Lord an ear to hear the wisdom of God and number three and this is probably or it is the most important the love of God those three are the basis of exercising proper judgment now go with me to Galatians chapter 6 I think we've got just enough time to get this in Galatians chapter 6 <clears throat> Galatians chapter 6 and verse 1 says, Brethren, if a man be overtaken in a fault or a sin, a trespass, you which are spiritual, so you got to be spiritual to do this, you which are spiritual, restore such a one in the spirit of meekness, considering yourself, lest you also be tempted. I think the fact that the, says the man was overtaken in a fault I mean whatever it was he did he did it he was guilty and again we're 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 not judging by the law we're not just talking about the act whatever it was he did it but considering the entire situation he was overtaken in a fault in other words he's repentant He's sorry for what he did, and so on. And he said, Brethren, if a man be overtaken in a fault, you which are spiritual, 
restore such a one in the spirit of meekness. The objective of all judgment is restoration. <clears throat> you do everything you can seeking restoration. In Ezekiel chapter 18 and verse 23, God is speaking. He said, Have I any pleasure in the death of the wicked? says the Lord, and not rather that he should turn from his evil way and return to his God and live. That's out of the Amplified. That's God's desire. God wants to see the people restored. And again, you which are spiritual, restore such a one. So, it's a, the, the, again, we've touched on this, that the, the motivation of the judge is as important as anything. You cannot exercise true judgment with an ill motive it just cannot be done it cannot be accomplished and uh, again you which are spiritual restore such a one now uh, judgment again cannot come from a wrong motive let's look up three scriptures and then we'll be done turn with me to Leviticus chapter 19 <clears throat> Leviticus chapter 19 we got anything online <laughs> okay, we're good Leviticus chapter 19 and verse 15. Again, this is a word to the judges of Israel. Verse 15, it says, You shall do no unrighteousness in judgment. You shall not respect the person of the poor, nor honor the person of the mighty. But in righteousness shall you judge your neighbor. You shall not go up and down as a talebearer among the people. Neither shall you stand against the blood of your neighbor. I am the Lord. You shall not hate your brother in your heart. You shall in no wise rebuke your neighbor and, and not suffer sin upon him. <clears throat> you shall not avenge nor bear any grudge against the children of your people, but shall love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord. And we take that and say, well, everybody, you know, you love your neighbor as yourself. But that's a word to the judges. That's the attitude of right judgment. And he's saying here, basically, you cannot judge properly as long as you have an ill motive and you need to make sure that you're not hating your brother in your heart, that you don't have an ill motive against him, that you're in this position of authority and you're going to use that position to, you know, squash him like a bug. That's illegal. It's unrighteous. You got anything? <laughs> Nothing? Okay. Go to Second Thessalonians chapter... Three. Second Thessalonians chapter three. There are numerous instances of judgment being exercised by the apostles, uh, being exercised by the church. <clears throat> Second Thessalonians chapter 3 and verse 6 Paul is speaking he said now we command you brethren in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ that you withdraw yourself from every brother that walketh disorderly and not after the tradition which he received of us for yourselves know how you ought to follow us for we behaved not ourselves disorderly among you Neither did we eat any man's bread for naught, but wrought with labor and travail night and day that we might not be chargeable to any of you, not because we have not authority, but to make ourselves an example unto you to follow us. For even when we were with you, this we commanded, that, commanded you that if any would not work, neither shall, should he eat. Again, that's the only scripture my dad knew, particularly when it was time for me to mow the yard. Mm -hmm. uh, verse 11 like you said, the one where... He knows the one that says if uh, you don't get out of bed, poverty will get in bed with like you. Like an it, armed man. 
Yeah. Well, mm -hmm. yeah. Well, if you st if you stay in bed, you sleep yeah, too long. Yeah. Poverty will. Get he knew that one. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Daddy come banging on my door about five or six in the, six in the morning. Hey, boy, get up. Poverty's getting in bed with you. <laughs> so that was his. That was his thing. He so, had his special scriptures. <laughs> yes, he did. <laughs> And, and he used them. Yes, he did. He had particular they on, ones yeah, he remembered. They weren't on the refrigerator, <laughs> but anyway. <laughs> I'm not going. Anyway, I, I, I can go a direction. It mm -mm. said, so, For we hear that there are some which walk among you disorderly, working not at all, but are busybodies. You know, he talked earlier about being a, being a tail bearer. Can I just say to you that one of the quickest ways to learn your ability or, or to distort your ability to discern is by being a tail bearer, by being a busybody, trying mm -hmm. to get in everybody's business. Because I want to tell you, mm -hmm. the more you know in the natural about a situation, the more it, it corrupts your ability to discern things properly. Mm -hmm. That's true on a prophetic level. It's true on a judgment level. Mm -hmm. So very very important mm -hmm. because your <coughs> opinion and your suspicion and your accusing manner and your looking for fault and sin has contaminated everything in you yep yep everything and it doesn't take a lot of contamination yeah. to be we deadly had, we had <laughs> we had one couple and the objective of a lot of what we went through is we want Kenneth and Cindy out of the way because we want this building. Mm -hmm. And there was one which that's wrong motive. And so one couple in particular sent people to San Angelo trying to find dirt on us. Mm -hmm. Just trying to find anything. I mean sent people mm -hmm. over there to try and investigate mm -hmm. you know, whatever. But whatever. Yeah. Anyway. Go ahead. Okay. Go ahead. Um, verse 11 again. For we hear that there are some which walk among you disorderly, working not at all, but are busybodies. Now then, now them that are, are such, we command and exhort you by, the Lord, by our Lord Jesus Christ, that with quietness they work and eat their own bread. But ye, brethren, be not weary in well-doing, if any man obey not our word by this epistle, note that man and have no company with him that he may be ashamed. Yet count him not as an enemy, but admonish him as a brother. Now this is important. This breaking of fellowship is not... Well, I don't want nothing to do with you. Yeah. No, that's the wrong attitude. That's the wrong spirit. You admonish him as a brother. Brother, look. I love you, man. I want this fixed. But you've got to make some changes. Mm -hmm. Say this after me. Boundaries are good. <laughs> they are. Mm -hmm. They're necessary. And just because you have boundaries does not mean you're not walking in love. Mm -hmm. So very important. Mm -hmm. Let me say this, show this to you. This is interesting. Notice what Paul said. Verse 14 says, If any man obey not our word by this epistle, note that man and have no company with him that he, King James says, that he may be ashamed. That word is translated ashamed in a couple of places, this being one of them, but it's translated in other places as to show regard or to have reverence. Uh, Jesus gave a parable one time and he said, uh, talking about... Uh, sending uh, you know he sent laborers into the vineyard and the and or sent uh, representatives into the vineyard of Israel and they were killed by the leaders and then it said the father said I will send my son and they will reverence him same word so a uh, better way to translate this would be have no company with him that he may learn to show respect or become respectful. In other words, um, love is not enough for fellowship. Well, we walking in love. We just fellowship with everybody. Man, you're a fool. 
because there are people out there that will take you to the cleaners. There are people in the body of Christ that are walking disorderly. And so you cannot afford, a fellow, afford to fellowship with them until they show respect. They have to mm -hmm. respect God, respect authority, respect leadership, respect themselves, respect you. Listen, you, don't, you can't have fellowship with somebody where there's no respect. You just can't. There's not any way. <clears throat> and you got somebody that disrespects you all the time. There's no way to have fellowship with them. If they don't respect what you do, who you are, they don't respect your call, they don't respect anything about you, there's just no basis for fellowship. Just not there. And, uh, I mean, you know, and granted, this was 1980. Uh, we'd gone to visit my folks. And we were sitting there one morning. Brother Copeland was on television. This was on a Sunday morning. I was watching Brother Copeland, and we were talking about ministry and stuff, which my folks have been clueless about what we do for... Always. Always. And I told my mom, I said, Mom, you have no respect for what we do. You have no respect for me as a minister. You have no respect for us at all. And she looked over at the TV and she said, when you get like him, I'll respect you. And so, you know, what are you going to say to that? There, there's, no, there's no basis for fellowship. <laughs> I mean, my mother and dad, well, big deal. There's still no basis for fellowship. But I will say this, they kept their end of the bargain because mm -hmm. after we went on television, not just doing a, a program, but we went on television on the network in Midland a couple of mm -hmm. times and then all of a sudden we were and they thought we were a lot better after yeah, we yeah, were we, on television yeah. you know so mm -hmm. by then I didn't care <laughs> it didn't matter I mean that was 18 mm -hmm. years later mm -hmm. so but the point is I don't care who it is family member whatever doesn't make any difference mm -hmm. where there is no respect there mm -hmm. is no fellowship Mm -hmm. just not any way mm -hmm. so that has to be there but I want to say to you we'll close go to 1 Corinthians 5 and we'll finish we gotta, we're got we done but I want to read this <clears throat> you got something online well Trixie <clears throat> had to leave she's not feeling well and so she had to go to bed so we need to pray for her okay. and um, Lucille just said in reference to your dad's select scriptures isn't that what you would call using scripture out of context oh yes yeah 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 yeah, yeah. but my dad did no i'm not gonna go there i'll, I'll, I'll leave that alone. and tony says first john yeah mm -hmm. yeah first john 2 9 through 11 mm -hmm. yeah if you hate your brother you're walking in darkness mm -hmm. you want to walk in the light you gotta love your brother Mm -hmm. yeah. Amen. Amen. First Corinthians. First Corinthians five. We'll finish with this. If you really want to get on God's bad side, do things that damage His body. First Corinthians five, verse one, said is reported commonly among you that there's fornication among you and such fornication, as is not so much as named among the Gentiles that one should have his father's wife, and you are puffed up and have not rather mourned that he that has done this deed might be taken away from among you. For I verily as absent in body but present in spirit have judged already as though I were present concerning him that had done this deed. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, when you're gathered together in my spirit with the power of our Lord Jesus Christ to deliver such a one unto Satan for the destruction of the flesh, that the Spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. Your glory, glorying or boasting is not good. Know ye not that a little leaven leavens the whole lump? Purge out therefore the old, old leaven, that you may be a new lump as you are unleavened, for even Christ our Passover is sacrificed for us. Therefore let us keep the feast not with old leaven, neither with the leaven of malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. I wrote unto you in an epistle not to company with fornicators, 
yet not altogether the fornicators of this world or with the covetous or extortioners or with idolaters, for them must ye needs go out of the world. But I have written unto you not to keep company if any man that is called a brother be a fornicator or covetous or an idolater or a railer or a drunkard or an extortioner with su such, such an one know not to eat. Now, this guy was sleeping with his stepmother in the middle of the church. Everybody knew it. They were very public about it. And everybody knew it. And they came to church together. And it said, he said here, your glorying is not good. There was, there's a couple of things going on. But one of them was, um, just look at God's grace. I mean, God's grace is so wonderful. Here's this couple, they're committing this sin, but... But God's grace is more than enough to take care of it and cover it. Oh, thank God for His grace. And see, if anybody tried to bring any correction to this situation, well, this, this couple turned it down. Well, I, you know, I'll do what I want to do. I'm not under the law. And Paul was saying, break fellowship with them. Have nothing to do with them because they're going to do damage to the body. A little leaven leavens the whole lump. And he said, do this, verse 4. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, when you're gathered together in my spirit with the power of our Lord Jesus Christ, to deliver such a one unto Satan for the destruction of the flesh that the spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. Now, you need to realize that when judgment has to be exercised, this is not just, well, you know, you're not welcome in our little group anymore. That's, that's not it. There's way more involved in this. Every local body has a spiritual covering. Every local body has a spiritual covering. And that covering is a protection that is part of the fellowship of the saints. I mean, one will put a thousand a flight, two will put ten thousand a flight. Thank God we've got each other. Mm -hmm. where the body of Christ is concerned. And it's especially true of a local body. What Paul was saying here is withdraw that covering. Because Satan, he was hiding in, in that protection. He was living in sin in that protection. Mm -hmm. And Paul said, remove that co covering, have nothing to do with him. Jesus said, treat, treat him as a publican and a heathen. In other words, Quit praying for him. Cut him out of your prayer life. Have no fellowship with him whatsoever. The only thing you could pray properly was, Lord, bring him to repentance. But we remove that spiritual covering. The guy is sowing seed that's opening the door to the devil and trying to use us as a means of tolerance. Well, we're just going to walk in love. No. Mm -mm. There you go. Have at it. Here's the harvest. You're sowing to the flesh. You're going to reap corruption. It's that simple. So, when it comes to the body, Jesus is serious about it. You're not going <laughs> to tear up his church. You're not going to tear up his body. You <laughs> will find yourself out on the curb in a heartbeat mm -hmm. when it comes to that so anyway i hope that gave you some insight into exercising spiritual judgment and we'll we'll continue talking about this this is a series on taking our place as kings and we'll deal more with this as we go amen good word thank you the lord is good Tony says, walk in the light as he is the light <coughs> and yeah. you fellowship with one another. Yeah. Uh, Lucille says, lack of respect is probably why a lot of today's children don't have a real relationship with their parents. Burl says, like you, my parents never understood what I was called to either and they were not disrespectful, at least not openly, openly but they didn't get it. Yeah. Um, then he says, uh, not sure how to say this, but as far as my pastors, I trust you. And if you know me, you know how extraordinary that is for me to say because I don't trust much of nothing outside of God. Uh, Lucille, um, that's why we need to seek God's wisdom in all things. Yes. Yeah. Amen. 
and that's well, it. Well, I appreciate that, Denny. I really do. And we mm -hmm. don't we don't take it as a light thing. Not no. from you, not from anybody. Um, I mean, because trust is is a you can't mm -hmm. minister to people without trust. You just mm -hmm. there's just not any way to do it. Mm -hmm. So thank you. Amen. Yes, thank you. Amen. And thank you all for being here. We appreciate you all. Continue to pray for us. Um, as we prepare for Romania, yes, for us a, and Burl. We, we still have a lot on the plate mm -hmm. that will have to be dealt with yeah. between and, now and then. Uh, an update on the books that went in for the Kairos. Uh, I do have some copies left, but not very many. Uh, it has been uh, read by a number of other people who are now passing it along to others. And so that's a good thing. Yes. And we're going to redo it. Uh, all of the we'll problems that happened we'll between do. the computers, uh, we will get that corrected yeah. in the new uh, copy. The new copy doesn't have to be done the same way because it's not going into prison, at least not yeah. at this point. Well, we're probably, and it's not expensive, but I think we're going to do the plastic binding. Mm -hmm. You can buy a machine relatively mm -hmm. cheap. But we've got a lot of uh, things coming up. A lot of expenses coming up, a lot of things we have to deal with between now and the time we get on that plane. So mm -hmm. just stand with us and mm -hmm. we'll, we'll get her done. And um, April the 11th, we're supposed to have another run through on uh, changing from Verizon to Frontier. Guys coming in from Frontier, they got, I'm telling you what, it's, it's just it's slow as molasses, but we're, we're making progress and hopefully we'll get that done. I would like to get it done before we leave. It'd be great, but I don't know that we will, but we're headed that direction. So. Amen. Uh, Robert Davis says, a mind-opening teaching to judgment. Thank you. Thank you, brother. And um, Dana Shasta, thanks all. Lucille, thanks for another great message. See you next week. And let's pray for Trixie yeah. and bless the people. Why don't you pray? We'll Father, in the name yes, of Jesus, Lord we Jesus. just lift up Trixie before you right now. And we as a body come mm -hmm. together agreeing together for her according yes, to your Lord. word that by the stripes of Jesus she was healed she is, he is healed. healed in the name of the Lord yes, Jesus Lord. Christ we just ask you to minister your healing strength to her to her to Shasta to Dan to Tina yes. and Jake yes, to yes, everyone yes, yes. who needs healing yes. in your body in receive it Jesus. now in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and father we bless these people we bless these precious ones that yes. you've joined with us Everyone, yes. in Jesus' name, amen. 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 God bless we you love guys. We love you, and we will see you next Thanks week. Thanks for staying with us. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.